things up just a little bit again. Uh, today is, we're calling it Flip Sunday. Uh, Colton is preaching the early service and landing the next service, but I don't like it when I don't get to preach. So the way we're going to do this is uh, Colton will be preaching in that spot that we did have the DVD. If we get another series that we are interested in, we'll just run that straight through, like Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday until we get through it. So he'll be, on the first Sunday of the month, Colton and will be preaching the early service and me the second. And then we're still going to do a flip on family day, but I'll be preaching the early service and Landon will be preaching the second service. All right? Have I got you thoroughly confused? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, next month, work day is on the 26th. We have a missionary, Andy Smith, to China. will be here the 27th. And I kind of messed up because I, I booked back-to-back -back missionaries, which I try not to do, but I wasn't paying attention. But Randy Teachout will be here then um, on uh, April the 3rd. Well, some of you know the Teachouts. You know what they went through and are really still presently going through. So they're going to come share about their work. Then uh, Sunday through Wednesday, April 17th through 20th, Brother Tully will be here. So... Always look forward to that. All right. I think that will do for the announcement. Just, oh, just a reminder about sign-up sheets in the back for the um, Passover meal. And then also, are we doing anything today about the the trip, or you want to wait a week because we got so much going? Yes, you want to wait a week. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's sing a song. Bruce got a couple of 161. Let's stand together if you're able this morning. 161.
we'll thank you for it. In whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seen. I have just a real quick update on the uh, the uh, bathroom. We'll call them the bathroom project. I don't know. Maybe I'll come up with a better name than that. But, uh, but anyway, that's what it's going out to. Um, I, I got with the architect. I'm going to tweak it a little bit different. I'm going to try to have enough restroom space to function to, to service the whole building. And then we're also going to expand the, the storage area to, into a classroom. And so if we're able to do that, we're going to be able to move things around and, and even expand the kitchen eventually. Because um, I think we need we, the kitchen needs a great big slop sink so that Mary can wash those pots and pans easier. I'm just trying to make things better for Mary. <laughs> or Bill. <laughs> All right. Anyway, that's kind of the direction we're going. I'm just waiting, and we're supposed to get some proposed uh, sketches back pretty soon from the architect. So, just want to keep you in the loop. All right, Colton's going to share with us this morning. Right. Good morning, everybody. How is everybody doing this morning? Good. 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 Sounds just about like my youth class does. Half yays, mostly silent. All right. Um, just that quick announcement. Uh, I know Pastor already said it, but I do have those sign-up sheets in the back for Passover on uh, the meal. If you want to sign up, just put your name on it, how many people you think may be coming. Also, there's another sign-up sheet if you want to participate and help in some way as far as with bringing food and other things that we need. Um, and that's back there as well. So, all right, if you have a Bible with you, please open up to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. Those have heard me give devotion or speak before, I, I tend to really like to stay in the Old Testament. Not that I think the Old Testament's something greater than what Christ has given us, but it was made for our instruction. Amen? There's a reason why we have what I consider, we call the Old Testaments, I call the Old Testaments, as in the Old Testimonies. And I think that they're there and they're important for us. Today, I kind of want to go into that. And before I start with Exodus, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 says, For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. If you follow along with me in Exodus chapter 19, starting in verse 1, we're going to go through verse 11. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and, and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Verse 5, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe for you forever. When Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people 
and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down from on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Abba, we, again, we just thank you that we have such a loving and wonderful God. Lord, I thank you that we are here together. Lord, our hearts, have, Lord, it wasn't of our own volition that we came here today. Lord, it was your spirit that guided us, Lord. We, it is not a human thing for us to want to be, Lord, a servant of anything but ourselves. But Father, here we are. And I pray today that you would speak in our hearts. Lord, you would help me to be clear and, and concise, Father, and just pour out, Lord, what you've put on my heart. Lord, may you speak through me and into our hearts and challenge us today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Here in Exodus, we find the Israelites, through God's hand, have been delivered from their taskmasters. They've been delivered from the Egyptians. And as they, here on the third moon, they come upon Mount Sinai, God talks to Moses. He tells Moses to relay to them, look, I have taken you out from Egypt. I've taken you away from those whom you were once slaves for, and now you are with me. He goes further and he says in verse 5, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you will speak to the people of Israel. I find a few things with the Hebrew people I find a few things when I look at the Hebrew people and I see in our own lives as Christians, I see amazing parallels and I don't think that's something that is ever done by accident. God doesn't do things by accident. God never has... To, I think God is so infinitely wise and knowledgeable that, again, as we go here towards the Passover, I'm going to be preaching a bit on that, but I think that God, and I believe this with all my heart, had something more to share than just what he shared with the people of Israel. The people of Israel may have the promises that they had and the things that God had relayed through Moses to them, but I do believe that when we as people of God ourselves look and see that he was ultimately pointing to a future, he was pointing to Christ. He was pointing to what we would have to endure. There's a reason why, again, we are told that the scriptures are intended for our instruction. I believe that our journey with God mirrors that of the Hebrew people. And I want to start. First and foremost, we were brought out of slavery by God. See, the Hebrews were in slavery. The Hebrews were told to build bricks without straw. Things were hard for them. They were told they had to live a certain way. They had to be a certain way. In fact, we'll find out here later on the scriptures, God is very clear. I don't want you to act as you once were. You were slaves. You are no longer those slaves. I don't want you to act as Egyptians, which at the time, Egypt was the pinnacle of society in that world. I don't want you to even act like the best the world has to offer. I want you to be my people. Exodus 13, 14, And when in time to come your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him, by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. The Hebrews were slaves brought out by a strong hand of God. And we were too. We too are brought out of slavery. 
Not only were we brought out of slavery, again, go to Galatians 5.1, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. What an amazing thing to think about. How many of us in this room today remember, we probably don't think about it much. We probably don't think about it much. Why should we? But take a moment now to think of who you were before Christ. Just take a moment to think about that. Who were you before Christ? For some of us, even me, myself, I can remember who I was without Christ. But it does seem like a distant memory. It does seem like that was a person I am not acquainted with anymore. And we shouldn't be, amen? But at the same time, we do need to remember from where we came from, and that was from a place of slavery. And just as the Hebrews were brought from a place of slavery, now they too and us, we are brought by a strong hand of a mighty God. And praise God. And praise God. Another thing I find that mirrors the Hebrew people in our walk is God guides us by the Spirit, just as He guided the Hebrew people. And He does not depart from us. Hebrews 13.5 Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For He has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. See, in Hebrews, they were being taught not just we're not going to be forsaken, but he's saying what not to follow. What to follow and what not to follow specifically. Deuteronomy 31.6, that's what this verse, by the way, in Hebrews is echoing, is this verse here. Keep your life free, or I repeated it again. He's telling you, I will never leave you nor forsake you as he's talking to the Hebrew people. Well, again, what a great promise we have. Not only are we brought out of slavery by the strong hand of a mighty God, but we are led by that God. Not only are we led by that God, but He promises never to leave us or forsake us. How many times in my life I've looked back. In fact, this morning as I was going through this, it was really hard for me to kind of focus I've kind of had a, I want to say lately, a honeymoon experience in my life. I've gone through a pretty low point through the years, even though I've been feeling pretty rich in God. But now, he's kind of put me on a higher point. I have a job that honestly allows me to have, I don't have to ever worry about Sundays anymore. You can ask pastor and Landon and other men who know me pretty well, that was something that bothered me to absolute death. Worry me week by week by week. Am I going to have to argue with my work whether or not I'm going to be able to be here or not? Of course, I eventually told the last work I had, I'm just going to go and I'll suffer the consequences for it. But God has given me a job now. I don't have to have that. And it's an amazing thing to think of when the times I've never, des- I've never done anything to deserve what I have. See, nothing I've done I deserve, but again, here I am because of God, because of what God has done for me. And I can't help but think of that point in time of Hebrew people looking around and saying, see, the Hebrews didn't want to be rescued. They didn't even know they needed to be rescued. Go back to when Moses confronted Pharaoh. What, did, what happened? They were told to build bricks without straw. What did they tell Moses and Aaron? Shut up. Leave us alone. You're making it harder for us. They didn't say rescue us. They didn't say, oh, well, here comes God. Yes. No, they didn't say that at all. They said, leave us alone. And I think about a time in my life when I was told about the gospel and about God, and I continuously kicked back and said, just leave me alone. I look at people today. You know, there's a lot of things going on in the world. And it's easy for our hearts, where we're at now, we're rescued, we're not slaves, to think 
on them and those people who are going through things right now and their hearts are hardened saying, well, I don't want God. Even in our own country. Look around us. A majority of people say that now. Leave me alone. And it's easy for us to say they get what they deserve, but by God's grace, we should be in that place too. We need to remember there are other slaves. In fact, remember the Hebrew people, the Israelites weren't just made up of just Hebrew slaves. There were sojourners that came along with them too. Another thing I see that mirrors us, again, we're led... As we are led by the Spirit, they were led by a cloud of fire. Verse Exodus 13, 21 and 22. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people again, God does not leave his people. And for them, they had a physical thing. Physical or not, we have his presence. We have his presence that leads us, and we have something greater. He is in us, and he leads us. We have scripture. We have God's word to lead us. This was something they were just getting. They did all the hard stuff. We don't have to. Let's not be stubborn. Verse 3, we are to be immersed and brought out of water. Something interesting that I found that that mirrors the Hebrew people. They they came out from water. There's a picture here that continues to repeat. Again, I don't think God does anything by accident. As we, as slaves, crossed over from the former world, the Hebrew people did too. In fact, the Hebrew name means to cross over. Simple enough. To be a Hebrew meant you were crossing over from what you once were to being a child, a servant, a person, a people of God. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when we get baptized, which has another bit of meaning with the priest caste, with the Levites, but I still think and believe that this has some correspondence. Again, baptism which corresponds to this now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When I am baptizing, I am identifying myself as one of his children. I'm identifying myself, yes, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but I am identifying myself, again, as a servant, a child of the living and great and awesome God that has delivered me to that point. Again, if you look in Hebrews, rather Exodus chapter 14, the Hebrew people crossing the Red Sea. Don't think about that very much that way, I don't think. But it's true. God parted the waters. They went in where the water should be. They came out where the waters were. They've crossed over. They're out of bondage. What happens? Those that would keep them enslaved were destroyed, and they were separated from them. They were separated now from what made them slaves. In a way, it's God finalizing, saying, no, no. I am their God. They are my servants. No longer yours. He's showing the power, and he shows the same way. And I believe that's what baptism, in a way, shows for us. We are no longer slaves of this world. If we're identifying in Christ, is that not true? If I'm identifying with Jesus, I'm no longer trying to say, I'm I'm with this world. I'm saying, I'm with God. (laughs) Again, 
Another mirror I find is we are fed manna. We're fed by God's Word every day. Every single day. John chapter 6, verse 58. Oh, rather, in Exodus chapter 16, rather, the Hebrew people were fed manna. Christ likens, He says, this is not what you're fed. What you are being fed is from above is not the same as what the Hebrew people were being fed, but it is the Word of God. It is my flesh. And the same that the Hebrew people were fed manna, we find that Christ likens it to being His Word. How rich we are to be fed by God's Word every day. Another thing that I find amazing is, it's just simple enough if we want to be very simple, our Father who art in heaven. What does he go on to say? Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Then he talks about what? Give us this day our daily bread. Number one, we can think of that as provision. And he does. He promises that. Christ even continues forward. He solidifies that promise and says, I love you. You are my people. I'm going to provide for you. You know, that's something that has stuck true in my life and in my, the troubles I have. And i got to ask, how many of you today, right now, or you know somebody going through that trouble, that trial, where I don't know where my next meal's coming from? Because I have. Where am I going to, how am I going to pay for this? Because I have. I'm probably still going through that. (laughs) But I don't worry about it because God has always provided. We were praying this morning. Think about it. This church, how many times have we looked and we've had a need? And we go before God and we go, God, we don't know how you're going to do it. But we're trusting in you. And almost every single time, God has come through way faster than we could ever imagine. And He's continued to provide for His people, for His children, for those who love Him. So He physically provides. He spiritually provides His Word too. As I'd spoken, I think my last message about not feeding our children and ourselves enough of the bread of God. How can we ever put on the armor of God if we're not fit enough to carry it? I have to be strong to carry some, some armor, I think. If we really think about it, we, we're not in that time and age, really, where we do. But if you look at our military today, they've got a lot to carry. 80-pound packs, vests, guns, probably another person. They've got to hike miles and miles and miles. I don't think they're going to get very far with that pack if they're not fit and they're not eating properly enough to be fit to get it. We need to be doing the same. Another mirror I'm finding is we have the law. We call it God's Word written on our hearts. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, You yourselves are our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Paul here is, of course, likening the fact that Usually, he he starts out in this chapter wondering whether or not he needs to send letters of recommendation or need a letter of recommendation for himself. But what he's saying here is, but the people who I've ministered to, they are our letter of recommendation. You say, well, what does that have to do with the Spirit? What does that have to do with the law? 
If you go here, he's also likening the fact that what he has done, not because of his own self, but what the Spirit has done through him and to the people, that that is something not written in tablets of stone referencing back to Moses, back to Mount Sinai when the commandments were given, but back to now that it is written on our hearts, that we're living the Word of God. We're no longer looking at the Word of God and saying, well, you've got to do this, and you've got to do this. If you want to be a good person, you've got to do this. It's now, I'm living it. I love it. And God promised that in His Word. Something amazing that maybe I'll talk about another time is traditionally the Jewish people believe that when you look at the, the Feast of Weeks, so you have the Passover, which is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and you have the Feast of Weeks, which actually we call Pentecost. Penta just means five. If you look at the days, 50 days after what God's Word said, that's when you were going to have the Feast of Weeks. On the day of Pentecost, which was a Israel holiday, day that God was supposed to, remember, we're supposed to gather, they're supposed to gather and sacrifice one of the first fruits that are coming through. Well, what happens? The Holy Spirit comes. Traditionally, they believe that Moses was given the law on Mount Sinai at that day. How fitting that on the same day that the law was written on everyone's hearts. If you think about that for a moment. Again, I don't think God does anything by accident. It's something as I read the scripture, I always keep an open mind and heart about, is that there seems to be a repeat. And not that it's a, he's being repetitive, but that he had a plan from the beginning. And he's just so awesome that it continues to wave through. If it's not broke, why fix it? <laughs> and we're talking about an almighty God. What plan is going to be ruined by him? Or You know what I mean. Who's going to ruin his plans? What enemy is going to come against him? Why change it? Just an amazing thing. Again, they might have had law written on tablets of stone, but we have it written on our hearts. Another mirror I find is we wander foreign and hostile lands until we reach the promised land. And how much do we forget that? We know that we're ambassadors for Christ, but do we remember and look forward to, as the Israelites did, going to the promised land? 2 Corinthians verse 5, or chapter 5, rather, verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making His appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. John 17, verse 14 through 18, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so have I sent them into the world. What is Jesus implying here? What is he actually directly saying, honestly? He's saying we're not of this world anymore. We're people of God. But we have to live here. And I'm sending you out into a foreign and hostile land. Just as the Israelites were too. Again, the Israelites, what, were they, what, what happened to them? They were sent into a land of Canaanites. People who were completely godless. Talking about a land of giants, mighty people. In fact, a demonically influenced world. He says, I'm sending you out to them. Now for them, it wasn't to witness, but he did say, you're going to be holy. <laughs> he said, you will be one of my people. 
He said that eventually you're going to go to a promised land. John 17, verse 14 to 18. I have given them your word. I just said that, didn't I? What I mean is verse 3. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. He's saying that when we have eternal life, what is it? Knowing God. We go to Revelations. We're being told that there is a time where all this is over. Everything is happening with Ukraine and Russia, the world, everybody fretting about, about what's going to happen. And nothing new under the sun. Last two years, COVID, where am I going to go? Oh no, my mortality. Everybody's being faced with their mortality, that this is not it. Amen. Well, for them, this is it, and that's why they're losing their mind. Yeah. They have nothing to grasp onto. But we, being children of God, we know differently. We believe differently. We trust differently. Why is there, why is there such backlash against Christians right now? It's odd. It's because what we believe in. <laughs> it's because we believe we are saved from the second death. We are saved from a life of nothingness because that's what it's going to be. Nothingness. Hell is a place of burning. Hell's real. As I've talked with so many people that I know, eventually we'll sit and talk about it. Hell's not a popular subject today at all. But when you bring it up, and even in youth we've talked about this, do we believe that? We talk about heaven. But do we really believe there's a hell? Had there been a time that we believed in it at least? See, we get grace here on earth. Even if it says God gives grace to the wicked. We still have the presence of God in our lives here. Hell is a place where there is no presence of God. Who could ever know what that's like? Who? Who? except those who are tormenting there now. We get a glimpse of that when Christ tells us the story of Lazarus. And he begs, send somebody. Don't let them suffer. Send somebody. But again, in Revelations, we're told that this will all be over and that we have a promised land that is coming, that we will be with God as he rules with us and for us forever. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 17, or Exodus chapter 3, verse 17, rather. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared to me saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. That's a lot of ites. A land flowing with milk and honey. Are we ready for that land? See, that's the question for us. We're going to have a land greater than that. We're talking about physical. And for them, he's saying, there's nothing sweeter that you're going to be in. And for us, it's the same. It is no wonder then that Paul wrote to us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 and 17. And how from childhood have you been acquainted with the sacred writings? What are the sacred writings? Amen. Which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Again, the sacred writings talking about the Scripture. We've got to think in, in, in his time. The New Testament, these were just letters not even compiled yet. He talks about Scripture, he's talking about what we would call the Old Testament. That was the Scriptures. He's saying those are what are good for us. I'm not saying anything against the New Testament. Those are profitable and, and what we need today too. That is still God's word. But for them, thinking in the time period and in context, he's saying, look, 
This is what we have. And look, look how great it is. Again, the reason why I bring this up, why I see parallels is because I believe that even the, the young church, the first church was pointing and saying, we need to get instruction from the early days, from the days that God had brought the Israelites out, from everything. Scripture is important. Scripture is important. doesn't matter if it's from the beginning or to the end. In Romans chapter 15, verse 4, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. And again, how many people do we read about in the Old Testament? That's exactly what happened. They had endurance. They had faith. They encourage us. It's important for us because they're examples to us. As I close here, honestly, I want us to focus today on that first one, the being freed, the who we are. There's a lot of parallels, but I want us to focus on that. Who are we? What are we freed from? Galatians 5.1, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. What yokes of slavery? Romans 6, chapter 22 Romans chapter 6, verse 22. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. Again, I'm repeating myself again today. You can see that my notes are off a little bit. It points back to sin is our what we are set free from. We are set away from sin. Number two, we're set away from worldly principles and standards. Galatians 4.3 In the same way we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Verse 8 and 9, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? What he's saying here, this is the things that we grow up in and we're being taught are the standard. This is world standards. That's what he means by elementary principles. We can't fall back to the standards of this world. Why? Because it's a demonically influenced world with slave-minded principles. Do not go back to your former selves. Do not go back to being a slave. Do not follow what other people do. Again, read where Exodus, what does God tell the Hebrew people? What does he tell the Israelites? Don't be like the best of them. Don't be like the Egyptians. Be like people for me. We also find another one, fleshly desires. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. In verse 24, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. We're set, free, set free from our own desires. The Hebrew people had their desires. Remember, they complained that they wanted fish. They wanted to be back being slaves so they could just have something that wasn't manna. <laughs> I don't want any of this. And how many times do we say the same thing? How can we say that? We forget who we once were and who we are now. And that's why I want us to focus that in closing today. We need to remember who we were and why we are today, who we are now. When God chooses a people, He demands they be holy, they be separate from the world and everything around them, and not act as former slaves. Again, Leviticus chapter 18, verse 1 and 4 
And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt, where you lived, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. Again, if we are not slaves, then who are we? We're free servants of God. That's who we are. Again, go back to everything we have talked about today. We're free servants of God. We're royal priests, mentioned in 1 Peter 2.4. We're a royal priesthood. Again, in Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and 6. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a nation, holy nation, a people for His own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That sounds like something straight out of the New Testament, but it's not. That's what God told the Israelites. He told them you're going to be a priestly nation. We're to be a priestly nation, a kingdom for Him. And if we're priests, we're holy keepers and authority of God's Word, servants of God, intercessors for the people. And lastly, we're sons and heirs. We're sons and heirs. Galatians 4, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved by the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, an heir through God. If we are no longer slaves, then let us, and that's the challenge today. If we're no longer slaves, let's act like what, we suppo- what we're supposed to be. Servants. Priests. Sons. A light, as Pastor had preached just a week or two ago. Light in a dark world. Salt, as everything around us is rotting and decaying. Sojourners, as we pass through this world. Ambassadors, to represent God's kingdom. Men and women who identify under, the, under Jesus' name. Christians. Again, let us remember who we are, not who we formerly were. Let us act then as we should be. Lord, I thank you for this day. Again, I just thank you for the privilege of speaking your word. Father, forgive me, forgive us when we don't act as men and women of God. Forgive us, Lord, when we continue to live and act as the world around us. When we act as slaves, the very thing that you saved us from. And Father, I pray today that you would, if there's anyone in here that has, is still a slave, God, of this world, who still doesn't know you, who still is not, cannot identify in any of those things, Lord, that I had just spoken about, Lord, that you would put it on their hearts and see that, Father, we're, we're, you're right here and that you will take them out with a strong hand. Father, we give you honor and glory for it all. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you.